Dear Christian friends, brothers and sisters in God's family, today's texts are for those who have no more strength, who can go no further, who are crushed by life's tragedies, and who are weighed down by life's fears and pains and worries, and whose lives have been changed radically because of the troubles of life. It is for the young wife who decided to walk home after her car broke down and was struck by a hit and run driver. And she lay in the wet ditch from the rain, conscious and yet unable to move her arms and her legs. It is, she became, her life was shattered and she became a paraplegic. For the years that lay ahead, she would fight bitterness and depression and for her husband, there would be endless care for his now helpless bride. Today's text is for the retired worker who looked forward for his, to his golden years in retirement with his wife and then discovered that she had a crippling and painful bone disease along with Alzheimer's, the onset of Alzheimer's. She would rapidly lose her mind and her personality. And at age 65, his retirement dreams are shattered as he became more distressed and lonely. The words of our text are written by the Apostle Paul, who had devoted his Christian life to preaching about Jesus Christ and God's love for sinners, but who struggled with pain. He gives us a powerful reminder today that we are to rely on God's grace in time of trouble. And that's the thought I'd like to leave with you this morning. Let's rely on God's grace in time of trouble, first of all, by recognizing God's power, by calling on him for strength, and by trusting his answer. Now, the text right before, the chapter right before our text, gives us a glimpse of what Paul's life was like, his life was like after he became a Christian and as he preached about Jesus Christ. It wasn't a very pretty picture at all. He faced death repeatedly. He had been stoned. He had been flogged severely. He had been whipped on, on five different occasions with 39 lashes. He had been shipwrecked on three different occasions, one time being in the sea, in the water for a day and a half. He was imprisoned frequently, in danger often, often hungry and thirsty, going without sleep, even cold and naked. But he accepted these things as persecution for the sake of Jesus Christ. But there was something else that the Apostle Paul had a very difficult time coping with. And he begs God, as we read this here, begs him for release. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Take it away. The Greek word for thorn here means a sharply pointed sliver or a sharply pointed stake. There are many different theories of what this thorn in the flesh was that the Apostle Paul had. And we really don't know exactly, but what we do know is what does a thorn do? A thorn causes, especially if it were like a pointed stake, a sharply intense pain, hurting so much that it can destroy a person's focus on life. You know, it might be very hard for a person to drive a car if they have the thorn, to read a book, to concentrate on watching a TV show, or to even eat or get dressed by themselves. Thorns can come in any shape and size, can come as alcoholism, cancer, crippling arthritis, oh, it could be mental illness, loss of family, friends, loss of a home because of financial problems, marriage trouble, verbal, physical, sexual abuse, the atrocities of war and other crimes, it can all be thorns. But what's common to them all, it takes away from the real focus of life becomes so overwhelming that it's hard to think even about God and family and friends and, and what's fun in life, that it's just kind of overwhelming. You simply cannot live a normal life when you have a thorn 
like the Apostle Paul had. And the Apostle Paul knew that he was helpless. And Paul recognized his helplessness, and he believed that God knew his problem and also that God cared and that God had the power to help him. And there's the key. Do you still have a powerful God that can help you in any situation? Well, when the Apostle Paul had no more strength to go on, when he, he could go no further, well, he knew where to go. And so also, when we feel so weak and helpless at different times of our life, we need to pray and believe that God has the power to help us. And then we need to call upon him for strength. In his prayer, the Apostle Paul does something which we often do too. He offered a solution. It's not unusual for people to, to already think of what might be a solution for them when they go to somebody else for some advice, some kind of counseling. And so they want to run it past somebody. And, and so also in our prayers, don't we sometimes think, well, if God could only do this, then it's going to make me happy. And there's a couple ways of trying to solve a problem. One is to get someone else to change. Isn't that what Martha was trying to do with her sister Mary? You know, here comes Jesus with his 12 disciples into the home of their friends, Mary and Martha. And uh, Martha's so busy in the kitchen trying to make things nice for Jesus and the disciples. And what's Mary doing? Just sitting there. How lazy can she be? You know, Jesus, why don't you get her into the kitchen here? You know, and this, uh, sometimes like uh, maybe somebody may come to the pastor and say, my husband has this annoying habit that's driving me up to the wall. Can't you talk to him and make him change? Make him stop it? Well, see, the solution there is the other person must change. Martha never thought that maybe she needed to change because her, her priorities were a little bit different. As much as she wanted to do good for Jesus, Mary had chosen the one thing needful, the listening to God's word which is even more important than food for the body. But if in prayer we can also offer God another solution, is that is change, change the situation. God, you can change it, and you can do it if you want to. Take it away. And that's a prayer that can come from our pews here as we offer our prayers at the altar, uh, from our homes and from our hospital beds. You can change the situation you, if you want to, the problems, the fears, the worries that we have, just take it away. That's how David prayed. In Psalm 143, we read, O Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my cry, come to my relief, answer me quickly, rescue me. And then there was Jesus' prayer, wasn't it, the night before he was crucified to his heavenly Father. If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. And the Apostle Paul said, offering the same solution to God. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord. There's three special times. There certainly have been more times. But three special times. I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Take it away. Just get rid of it. And there's nothing wrong with suggesting solutions to God in answer to your prayer. That yes, Lord, you have the power to change. I believe it with all my heart to change the situation. You don't, and you can do whatever you wish. And I believe you have the strength, even if I can't have the strength, and I don't know where I'm going to go to next. You need to solve this for me. And we, we have to remember that God's solution may not be the solution that we come up with. I mean, he may say yes, or as Ephesians 3 tells us, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think or imagine. That's pretty incredible. But, you know, there's times where he says, wait, you need to be patient. Or there will be times where he simply says, no. And so we need to trust him for his answer to our prayers. You know, changing things might have been Paul's solution to his problem, but that's not what God had in mind. God's plan was to change Paul. And one of the most difficult things for us is to accept God's answer to our prayers rather than our own. That we pray for strength to bear whatever is troubling us 
rather than asking that the thorn be taken away. For the thorn may be just what God knows is good for us and what we need. Remember, God knows just exactly what's best for us and what we need. In the back of your worship bulletin, there's, can, trouble, can troubles be good? Well, yes, because that God of all comfort can comfort us in all of our troubles that we can comfort others in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received when we in faith believe what God has done for us. Well, the one who has arthritis can certainly relate to those who have arthritis. Those who have gone through alcoholism can re relate to those who are struggling with alcoholism. Those who have suffered the death of a husband or a wife can certainly relate to those and comfort those who have suffered the loss of a husband or wife. Can comfort them. As you've gone through it, the Lord can give you the strength and you can help others with that. So can thorns even work out for good to those who are God's people? Absolutely. The Apostle Paul started to recognize that too. He said, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations. The Lord had given him all kinds of revelations and different things. Just incredible. And made him a child of God. Keep me from becoming conceited. There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Yes, this was not easy. This was not like all the persecutions, the tormenting, the pain that came with it. And the Apostle Paul was given an answer by God that he had not considered. When the Apostle Paul thought that he was at the end of his rope and he could go no further, that's when God came to him. He said, my grace, my grace, my love for you is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. We don't always think of that, do we? In our weakness, God can show his power. Who had ever thought, or you'd think how foolish it would be, a former fugitive of a country would go back to the powerful king of that country and demand certain things of that king all by himself. Well, but that's exactly what God told Moses to do, right? Moses had killed a slave driver. He had fled. And God says, now, Moses, you're going to go back and you're going to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Yeah, all two million people. Yeah, Lord? Me? Yeah, you. Because it would be God at work there. And how about that shepherd boy, David, going up against a nine-foot-tall soldier, giant man, that Goliath, with a sling? You've got to be kidding. My strength is made perfect in weakness, how God shows. David knew, I have the Lord by my side. That's where my strength is, not in me. How foolish it would be if I think I could kill that giant. Oh, no. And so that's what the Apostle Paul came down to. Do you hear it in that one reading? No matter what the circumstances of life are. Yeah, and he certainly had a lot of troubling circumstances in his life. I've learned to be content. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength. The second reading, Jesus asked, was asked by his disciples, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sin or his, father, his, his parents' sins? And it had to be a reason. Well, Jesus said, yes, there's a reason, all right. It's so that the work of God uh, might be displayed in his life. Who would have guessed? They were looking someplace else. But God knows what is best, and we need to remember that. When the circumstances of our life want to rip us apart, when the thorns want to drag us down, when there seems to be no end of our problems, that's when we need to turn to God and hear him say to us who are so weak and helpless, my strength is made perfect in weakness, my grace is sufficient for you. And one hymn writer reminds us of that in a hymn in which he wrote, his grace is enough for me, a hymn in which he describes some very difficult situations of life. It's actually on the back of your worship of this uh, bulletin here that you have. I'm going to read it to you. Okay, it's, His grace is enough for me. Just when I am disheartened, just when with cares oppressed, just when my way is darkest, just when I am distressed, then is my Savior near me. He knows my every care. He will never leave me. He helps my burdens bear. And then there's this refrain. His grace 
is enough for me. For me, his grace is enough for me. Through sorrow and pain, through loss and gain, his grace is enough for me. Just when my hopes are vanished, just when my friends forsake, just when the fight is thickest, just when with fear I shake, then comes a still small whisper, Fear not, my child, I am near. Jesus brings peace and comfort. I love his voice to hear. And there's that refrain, his grace is enough for me. The next verse. Just when my tears are flowing, just when with anguish bent, just when temptation's hardest, just when with sadness rent, then comes a thought of comfort. I know, my Father knows, Jesus has grace sufficient to comfort conquer all my foes. Yes, his grace is sufficient for me, is the refrain again. His grace, his all-encompassing love that just knows us inside and out, who promises he'll never leave us nor forsake us, who promises that he will be our strength, our refuge, our ever-present help in trouble and all the other promises. And when we lean on him and his grace, how important that is for us. How it gives us comfort when things are going terrible in our life. Now there is a, another weakness the Apostle Paul knew about. It wasn't anything physical, but spiritual. How very weak and helpless and powerless we are when it comes to sin and death. There's absolutely nothing we can do. Some people think they can get to heaven by their goodness. And God says, your righteousness is all of them are like dirty rags. You know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You can't get to heaven by your good deeds. We are helpless and powerless when it comes to sin and death. And yet God takes us as weak as we are. And he says, here, my son is going to take your place. And he's going to do what you cannot do. He's going to live that perfect life that you cannot live and give you his holiness. He's going to suffer the torments of hell for your sins, every last one of them. You might have heaven. And that's grace, isn't it? All pure grace. Love for you that we do not deserve. And yet he pours that out on us. When it comes to the forgiveness of sins, he says, by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is what? A gift of God. And what a tremendous gift that is which every day we say, get up and say, thank you, Lord, for that wonderful gift you've given to me. And then he, he reminds us that, yes, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We've got something wonderful waiting for us because the blood of Christ has purified us from all sins. We hear that, that wonderful uh, promise of salvation and forgiveness every time we come to church as we pour out our hearts confessing our sins and hearing the absolution and when we come to the Lord's Supper. One day, when we're at our very weakest, when our eyes can no longer see, our, our mouths can no longer speak, our lungs can no longer breathe, and someone has to lay our weak bodies into the dust of the earth, God will someday again demonstrate his power and will show us that his power is made perfect in weakness as he raises us from the dead and brings us to our heavenly home. And so, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when you have no more strength, when you cannot go any further, recognize God's power. Call on him for strength and trust the answer that he gives to you. Amen.